Welcome to the West Side Barbell Podcast. Today's guest is the one and only Jordan Syatt. Jordan, it's a pleasure for you to be here after so long. It's been like 11 or 12 years. It's been a minute, yeah. Uh, we both started at West Side Barbell at the same time. Um, via same day. Same day internship. Same day. And um, it's been quite a whirlwind adventure since then. Did you ever tell everyone how you got the internship? Has he ever told that story? I have no idea. Maybe in passing. Can you tell that story? Uh, just like you sent a Hail Mary email over to Westside Barbell. But you were in Ireland. And, yeah. And you were teaching, right? I was lecturing. I was doing stuff at, at night courses, uh, putting in a exercise and health related module. And then I wanted to go to New Zealand. And I really wanted to work with the All Blacks. Really wanted just to get more experience. Um... Then one of the lecturers said, why don't you try sending an email to Westside Barber if you want to learn about strength training? I'm like, sure. Sounds like a great idea. And right before I'm getting ready to go to New Zealand, Doris emails me back. And then I'm like, well, I got to go to America now. Had no concept of what I was going to do. Had no hotel, found the shittiest hotel. Thanks to like Louis give you references <laughs> of you should never go to. And came there, got a taxi where the gym was. And yeah, turned up the next day. I'm like, I remember, no, I got the bicycle. I yes. got the, that's what happened. <laughs> I got a bicycle, didn't know how to get back from Walmart, decided let me cycle on the freeway with bag in one hand and a frying pan in the other. Got, <laughs> the police got me and put me in the back, thought I was the biggest idiot they'd ever seen. Wait, did they actually put you in the back of the yeah, car? Yeah, they brought me back to the, the oh my extended God. stay I was staying at. They're on their, um, not walkie talkies, but their CBs. Yeah, yeah. And, there was clearly someone who was Irish that they knew, and they're like, you won't believe who we have, where he's from. <laughs> this guy, no, 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 the freeway, the, the freeway. Um, Riding your bike, bike on the highway. And then I cycled to Westside the next day, which was terrible. Everyone trying to run off the road. I crashed into the, the bushes out front, <laughs> and it was Louie and John Kerr. <laughs> they're out there with the wheelbarrow. That, remember the green yeah, wall wagon we had? Yeah, of course. And Louie's like, you're probably the guy from Ireland. I'm like, yep, that's me. <laughs> John Kerr shakes my hand and goes, welcome to hell, bitch. I was like, <laughs> okay. Oh, the garage doors are open. I look in and there, there was this happy guy in there. I'm like, wow. I'm like, this is, this is hell. And, and then I hear a thump, thump. I'm like, where is that? And then went in what was known as the girl side, went in that and looked out and I'm like, Oh, wow. There was Tony Balagoni, uh, AJ Roberts, Jake Anderson, Luke Edwards. Um, who else was there? Rich Douglas, Brandon Lilly. All those guys were there. And now I knew why you're smiling because the amount of weight, it was the speed that they were just throwing weight around. I'm like, I can't even max that out. Yeah. And then that was like, you're here in internship? Yeah. Yeah, me too. What do we do? Like there was zero structure, right? <laughs> <laughs> we just turned up. Um, and then I like tell your story because you, you came here with your mom initially, right? Yeah. So, man, it was crazy. So I was at the University of Delaware and I hated it. I hated school. But I had gotten involved in strength and conditioning from like 14 years old, starting with wrestling. And then I, I got an internship at a gym in a town near me when I was 14. And I remember finding Louis' videos on YouTube and I like, I was immediately obsessed. Like I would watch his videos all the time and read his articles all the time. I was just, I was obsessed. And so I was sitting in my dorm room at the University of Delaware, hating everyone I was going to school with, all my teachers, all the kids. I was like, this sucks. I just want to lift weights and learn how to lift weights better. So I just randomly was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to send Louie an email, not expecting him to reply, not expecting him to even read it. And I, and I said, uh, basically, hey, Louie, my name's Jordan Syatt. I'm a huge fan. I'm like 21 years old. I just want to come learn from you. I'll take the trash out. I'll clean the floors. I'll walk your dogs. I'll do whatever. Just like, let me come and learn and train with you. And I get an email back and I lost my shit. I couldn't yeah. believe it. And it was literally just one line. And it said, hey, Jordan, our weakest lifter squats 800 pounds. What do you have to offer, Louie? That's all he said. Yeah. And I'm in my dorm room freaking out. And I'm like, 
you guys have no idea who just emailed me like this. And I'm, I'm losing my mind. So I spent hours trying to figure out how I'm going to reply to this email. Hours trying to, okay, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And I came to the conclusion I had two options. I was like, number one is I can be super polite and respectful and just be like, you're right. I'm weak. Like I, there, I don't know if I could do anything, but like I, I go that route or I could go the really hard route. And I, the 21 year old ignorant me decided to go the really hard route. And I replied, still have the emails in my Gmail. I said, I don't give a fuck what you or anyone in your gym does. I'll outwork all of you. And that's all I said. And I didn't hear back. And I was like, oh my God, I ruined, <laughs> I ruined my chances. So then the next day I'm at the dining hall with my buddy Kyle and a couple other people. And I get a missed call. I get a, a call from an unknown number. So I just ignore it. And this, I saw these are flip phones at the time. So I got a flip phone, unknown number, whatever, ignore it. As I'm walking out of the dining hall, I see I have a voicemail. So I open up my phone, list my voicemail, and I say, I hear, hey, Jordan, it's Louis Simmons from Westside Barbell. Uh, I want to talk to you about potentially interning here. And I stop in my tracks and freak the fuck out. And no one knows. Like Kyle and the other people, I tried to explain to them, but they didn't yeah. get it. And um, I freaked out. I was so mad that I missed the call. But we ended up getting on the phone the next day. And I actually, I still have that voicemail on my phone. I'll never delete it. Sometimes I'll just listen to it, just listening to hear his voice and like, yeah. it's amazing. But the next day we got on the phone call for an hour and I couldn't believe that the Louis Simmons was talking to a random Jewish kid from fucking nowhere at the University of Delaware who could give him literally nothing while he was on the phone with me for an hour. Yeah. And he was just like explaining to me how conjugate works and how the system works. And at the end of the call, he's like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come to Westside during your spring break in April and we're going to see how hard you train. We're going to see if we're a good fit. And I was like, awesome. So my mom and I fly out. And my mom is this sweet little Jewish woman. Like, she has no clue what is about to happen. <laughs> I tried to let her know what West Side was like, but, like, I didn't want to scare her away from even letting us fly there and all that. So we f drive in. We, we fly to <laughs> We fly, get a rental car, come in. And we walk in and the first person we see is Shaq. So Shaq is strapping on his Converse All-Stars. And then Louie comes from the monolift right up to us, shirtless, tattooed head to toe, blood gushing out of his nose all over his, all over his chest. And he just looks at me and goes, you must be Jordan. And I'm starstruck. And my mom is scared shitless. Like his, all these dudes, huge, massive, outrageously like, gargantuan dudes are in there and uh and this guy with a bloody nose just gushing out just comes over and says you must be jordan my mom immediately walks out to the car and starts crying and i'm <laughs> meanwhile i'm in the, having the best time of my life yeah. and so louis says uh he's like uh, he's like hey today's max effort lower body he's like all right i was like cool so what do i do and he said uh he said the first move you're gonna do uh pin pulls from pin three and i said how much weight, how many sets and reps. And he just replied, go as heavy as possible until it hurts too much. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I did that until I was basically dead. And I was like, what's next? He was like, close stance, SS bar, low box, box squats. And I said, cool, how much weight, how many sets and reps? He said, go as heavy as possible until it hurts too much. And then, cool, what's next? Glute ham raises, go as heavy as possible until it hurts too much. We did that for two days in a row. Two days in a row, trained, and... uh at the, it was the hardest I've ever trained in my life. Yeah. And I was bloody and sore and everything. And at the end of it, Louis just came up to me and shook my hand and said, I'll see you over the summer. And I left and I was super happy. My mom and I went to Bob Evans and she begged me not to do it. And I was like, mom, this could change my life forever. Like I have to, I can't not do this. And so came back over the summer and uh, day one of my internship, I meet you. You ride up on your bike in a West Side barbell. And I was like, I didn't know who you were. I had yeah. no idea. And uh, that was it. That's that's how it got started, man. It was, it. I was right. It legitimately changed my life. Like Louis, 100%, I would not be anywhere close to where I am if it wasn't for Louis. And like, he never asked for anything. 
ever. He never asked for anything in return. He would pay for every meal. I remember one time I tried to pay for a meal at Minnelli's and he got, got pissed. super fucking pissed. Yeah. Like I thought he was going to beat the shit out of me. Um, he would always give me free protein and just like anything I needed. He was just like a father figure in a very, very unique way, in a very <laughs> unique Louis yeah. way. I remember one time I asked him, I was like, Louis, do you ever want kids? He was like, he, replied, he looked at me like odd. He was like, do you think I'd be a good father? <laughs> and that's all he said. Yeah. And, uh, and that was it, man. It was just, it turned into one of the most, the greatest blessings of my life. Did it confuse you when you were emailing back and forth asking how much does it charge? How much do you charge? Uh, that's what I was trying to budget. Yeah. I'm like, okay, how much did this cost? No response. <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's going to, like, how much do I have to pay? And there is no charge, period. That's yeah. what I got. I'm like, what do you mean there is no charge? There's always a charge. Yeah. And um, I was like, okay, got there. And then I asked again. He's like, what's, what's fucking wrong with you? Like, why do you not understand? Like, there's no charge. You just turn up and train. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I asked Janelle, who was there in the office. I'm like, do we have to pay? And she's like, well, you can pay for the books. I was like, oh, okay. There's no charge for the gym. She's like, no. I had forgotten about the the low safety squat, uh, SSB squats. Because oh. we came through that. Do you remember when, for everyone out there, there's two sides to the gym, yeah. right? There was the, the everyone who was incredibly strong on one side, and then there was people, it was either the, the lightweights or visitors going the other side, and they were doing low safety squat bar squats. We got to go over to the guy side, the big yeah. guy side. And I remember Louis going, if you guys can't get 135 pounds to a low box, you're never coming over here again. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember looking at you, I'm like, dude, this doesn't sound like this is that hard. <laughs> and then like the box kept getting lower dude. and lower to where it was basically like you're on the floor. Yeah, it was like at our ankles. It was so low in a yeah. close stance. And then it would change like, okay, you're going to do this for five minutes. I remember watching you do that. I remember, what, what do you mean for five minutes? And yeah. it's just like, okay, so we're going to do this for five minutes. And uh, I'm like, at what pace? And like, just as many as you can in five minutes. I was like, <laughs> why? Because I made the, the, like, what do you do? Like, I used to do Muay Thai, I used to do kickboxing. It's like, oh, okay, here's, here's what you can do. And I remember, I better not fail. I'm like, this is a big thing been over this side of the fence. Um, did you have any preconceived notions about the internship. When you came here day one, you talk with Louis, were you clamoring like, well, what's the structure? Or did you know that there's going to be no structure? I had no idea. And like, I had no clue. Fortunately, that's sort of how I am with everything that I like. I'm not, you know me, like I'm not an organized guy. I don't really have much structure in general. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. I was very lucky in that like, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was, I'm very comfortable with that. But I had, I had no clue. And so sort of showing up, there was no like, hey, this is what you can expect. This is what you're going to do. It was more just like, all right, we show up 8 a.m., 8 a.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. And then, so I, I just couldn't believe how much we were training. It was 8 a.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. We also came back for, I think it was 4 p.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. And then Tuesday Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, I forget, I don't know what time we trained, but we also trained those days as well. And just when we weren't training, Lou was like, all right, come back to the office, read the books. We'll talk about training, answer your questions. We'll go to, we'll go to Manelli's, we'll go to Bob Evans, we'll talk. And I, I couldn't believe how much time he gave us. Yeah, That was the craziest thing. This is, I don't give a fuck if someone's a celebrity. Celebrities don't mean anything to me. There's another person. Louis wasn't a celebrity to me. To me, he was he was like an idol, an icon, just like someone who I looked up to, who I wanted to emulate, who I learned a lot from. And so to have someone who had such a tremendous impact on the entire world mm -hmm. of strength and conditioning, I couldn't believe that he was giving me and, and both of us in my mind, he was giving me so much time and attention. He let me took, take the Westside Barbell cert for free. He didn't yeah. charge me for that. And like, as we're doing it, like he's asking us questions throughout the certification, like going out to meals with us, driving us to competitions, just giving, hey, here's these books, read these books. Just the most 
I think when people saw Louis online, it was easy to develop a preconceived idea of who he was and how he treated people. Mm -hmm. But man, at, at least for me in the relatively short time period that I was with him, he, he treated me better than I could have ever imagined anybody in his position to treat someone that he didn't even know. The special strength certificate. Yeah. That was, I couldn't have thanked you enough indirectly because your personality, you were always like, boom, front and center. Here's the answers. <laughs> and what Louis did for us was give us the search for free. He broke it up. We broke up the questions into chunks and we basically had um, our time with Lou. We would go in and he would examine us like a, <laughs> like a teacher with a student. And Jordan was number one, right? He was up there. But he would answer all the questions. Louis was like, that's not right. <laughs> and I'm like, it's this, this, this. And he like, Tom, what did you have? And I would just repeat everything Louis would say. He was like, exactly. And I'm like, dude, this is phenomenal. Like, I just keep, Jordan keeps doing his thing. And, and uh, I could do no wrong at the start. And um, but he had you... Uh, do graphs for his book. Yeah. I, and I remember, dude, how much of an honor that was for you. And you took so much time. Oh, my God. And uh, he was like, oh, okay. And, like, he had no idea of like, how much. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. He had and, me do the, the three-week waves for the jump progressions. Yeah. I was like, you trust me to do that? I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. It was um, then, like, we're seven days a week, we had Lou. Yeah. Fight night. We go over to his house, watch the fights. Yeah. You get pissed off. At that time, it was a dog, Jackie. Yeah. And you're like, what is going on? And then you'd watch him analyze fights. And you're like, holy crap. He knows yeah. a lot about fighting. Yeah. And we were very lucky in that we were not his athletes. Yeah. There's a big um, separation that if you were training there full time as an athlete, you had a bounty on your back that you owe the club. Yeah. Our bounty was, well, at least you competed then. Um was education. Yeah. Because he asked us to remember the newsletter. Yeah. We wrote two newsletters. I forgot about that. Yeah. And we guys come up to us at a meet like, like, do you think we're going to read all this? Because <laughs> you wrote a huge, I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you set the pace. So I have to like, we the writers novel of a uh, West Side Barbell went out. And people are like, we're not going to read that much stuff. <laughs> um, did you know you're going to compete when you were here? I didn't know that I would compete with Louie at a competition with Louie and all of Westside. I didn't know that. I knew I wanted to compete and I had competed in powerlifting a couple times prior. Yeah. And I knew I, want, I wanted to deadlift four times my body weight. I wanted to establish myself as a powerlifter and, and a, a good powerlifter. But I didn't know that Louie would say, hey, like, let's finish off with a meet. And it just, it lined up perfectly because I remember the day after the competition, that was when I was scheduled yeah. to go back home for school. And um, it was a huge, dude, my total increased by 300 pounds in three months. Squat bench deadlift went up 300 pounds in that time. It was just, it was insane. Well, I'll never forget that day. And I'm, I know I'm skipping kind of chronological order, but can you say what he told you? Because I, I remember after I power lifted me, you said, I'm done with college. I'm done with everything. Yes. I am going straight into this. Yeah. Well, I wanted to stay at Westside. Dude, I, I almost got Westside tattooed on my chest. I was, I was ready. I was like hook, line, and sinker, bought in. I was like, I'm staying here. I'm dropping out of school. I'm living in Ohio. I'm going to train at Westside for the rest of my life. Westside, Westside for life. That was like, that was, that was it. And uh, everyone in the gym supported it whether it was AJ or whether it was Tony or whoever it was, everyone was like, drop out, just train, just train. The only person who said no and the only person who really mattered was Louie. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. I was floored that he wouldn't let me do it. And I was like, why? And he said something to me that I, I've told the story a lot and I'll never forget it. He said, he's like, look at me. He's like, I'm tattooed head to toe. He said, uh, he's like, a lot of people, like, they'll never let me speak at, at a college. He's like, I'm not, like, well-spoken enough. He's like, the reason I brought you here is to teach you so that you can teach other people the right way to train. Like, that's why I brought you here. He's like, now you've learned the right way to strength train, so go do that. Go teach people. And that, for me, has been a, a constant guiding light, a, a constant north star for me in terms of what's my goal with social media, what's my goal with with my business, 
sort of emulating how he treated me. And then also always remembering, I got all of the knowledge that I have for free, especially the knowledge from Louis in terms of like strength training, conjugate periodization, all that, like all of it was for free. He didn't charge a dime for it. And what kind of a piece of shit would I be to then be like, okay, well, I'm going to have to charge people in order to, to get that same knowledge that Louis so willingly and, and easily gave to me. Yeah. So I was floored. I know my mom was very happy about it because like I just wanted to <laughs> drop out and she was very worried that I wasn't going to come home or go back to school. But yeah, the only, re the only reason I went back to school after that was because Louis said he wanted me to go get my degree so that I, I could be seen by other people as a legitimate source of uh, with legitimate education so that I could teach people the right way to train. Because that's all he wanted. He just wanted, that's what he told me. He just wanted people to know the right way to train. And that was it. So, and this is, I don't think we've ever talked about that. When you left, going back to college, what was your mindset? What was your focus? How did that change from your time at Westside? So before Westside, I had started the powerlifting team with two of my buddies at the University of Delaware, Nick Busan and Joe Ratteni, and we had started it together, but we weren't running it very well. It was pretty lackadaisical. Like our training was really hard, but we were also really only focused on ourselves. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a team. It was more we individually lifted together. Yep. And after seeing how Louis structured it and how devoted he was to his lifters and how he didn't let that get in the way of his own lifting as well, I was like, I've got to make a change. So I literally copied everything from having a morning crew and an afternoon crew. We started that at the University of Delaware and I would show up to the morning crew and I would lift with the morning crew and then I'd show up to the afternoon crew and I would just coach the afternoon crew. I wouldn't lift with them. Mm -hmm. And um, we really started to make it a cohesive team of lifters, men and women who just wanted to get strong as all shit. And just like, we, it was so intense. It was like a mini West side inside the University of Delaware. And we got in, we had all these issues with teachers and with other people lifting because we were setting up bands and chains and we got safety squat bars. We got everything and we stored them in the gym and uh, we were loud and we, we were yeah. taking up all the squat racks and we didn't give a shit. We we're just like, we're here to lift. And like, we would stay in a squat rack for like an hour and a half to make sure the whole team got through. And uh, I think that was one of the biggest things is just Louis focus on not just himself, but always bringing everybody up around him was I think probably one of the most priceless, priceless qualities that I was able to take from him mm -hmm. and to implement in my own life and realize if all you're doing is trying to prop yourself up and you don't at the same time build other people up around you, you're never even going to get as high as you could because as you bring other people up around you, everyone rises, mm -hmm. which makes everyone better. And it's, I think it's a, a better team unit. So that was probably the best thing. When did you, I won't say pivot from powerlifting, yeah. but you definitely split, right? You're powerlifting and then, then you made this huge impact through social media on education and trying to better everyone. Yeah. When was that conscious decision made or was it just a natural flow? It was a very conscious decision and it was a very difficult decision. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance in terms of I had, my entire world was wrapped up in powerlifting in large part because of Louis, in large part because it's just, it's what I did for many, many years. And my main goal for a long time was to deadlift four times my body weight. Like that's just, I wanted to hit that. That was the most important thing to me. I didn't miss a training session for years and years and years. I followed Louis' conjugate system for years and years and years. And um, all of my content was powerlifting based. Yeah. And so I built up an audience of people that were all powerlifters and clients who wanted to power lift mm -hmm. and I just wanted to power lift. But as I got closer to four X deadlift, you know, started getting injured, started like even just a, a, a the deadlifting portion of a workout would take a long time. It's, it just took a while. And I was also trying to build my business and 
I started to lose a little bit of the passion for it. Mm -hmm. And I remember I hit four times my body weight. I deadlifted 530 at 132. And I put the bar down at this competition. And in my head, I was like, I'm done. I'm done competing, at least for now. Um, and Because I knew that my passion had transferred from getting myself as strong as possible to helping other people get strong and healthy and incorporate these methods into their life. So I had a huge issue after that because all of my content up to that point had been powerlifting based, everything. And I was like, I'm willingly and deliberately about to change, which scared the <clears throat> shit out of me. Yeah. Because I was like, my whole business is built on powerlifting. And if I'm not powerlifting, if I'm not making powerlifting content, then people aren't going to want to hire me. And fortunately, I went with my gut and still followed suit. And I was like, listen, uh, I'm not as passionate about it as I once was. This isn't what I want to pursue anymore. I want to pursue more overall strength and health and education. So I just started posting more content about that and about sort of what I was going through and my transition away from powerlifting. And I think the one, one of the hardest, if not the hardest parts was I, I very much felt like I was going to let Louie down. Mm -hmm. But the way that I justified it in my head, it was like, I still was teaching the principles that Louie taught just for people who were never going to be powerlifters anyway. Yeah. It was because not everyone wants to to be a high level powerlifter. Not everyone wants to to have that be their training. So I was like, listen, how can I bring a conjugate system approach to everyday people? To have moms and dads and husbands and wives and and young people and older people. How can we make this available for everybody? Which I think is what Louis really wanted. He just <laughs> wanted people to like train properly, which doesn't necessarily mean like every single person needs to max out every single week. But if you have the principles of maximal effort method, the principles of dynamic effort method, the principles of the repetition method. If you have that, then everyone can use conjugate in some way, shape, or form. And so it was, I believe that was January 24th of 2015 is when I did that deadlift. And after that, I was done. And I, I haven't competed since, but uh, I've still worked with a lot of powerlifters, but that was that was the last time I stepped on the platform and, and deliberately decided to shift away from powerlifting. Did you uh, call up Lou or talk to Lou in between this transition? Did you? No, I didn't. I think um, there's a lot, but I, a, lar a large part of me, I think, was embarrassed. I mean, Louis was in his 70s and he was powerlifting from, since he was like 12. Yeah. And like, he just didn't stop ever. And so I think I was partly embarrassed, partly thought I was letting him down and then the other part of me also thought, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to take this guy's time just to tell him that I'm not going to power. Like, yeah. like he gives a shit. Yeah. Like, who he there? He's going to be like, who are you? <laughs> like, as if he would even remember me. So I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to bother him with this. I'm going to. He told me to educate people. I'm going to educate people. So I didn't. I didn't call him or any of that. Is there anything that really hit you hard? from an educational standpoint that you got from the internship outside of giving to people? I think probably the biggest, and there were a lot, a lot, but if I'm going to pinpoint one, it's that there wasn't a day that I interned with Louis that I didn't see him referencing a book, that I didn't see him going back in and opening books to like read something, to check something, he's been doing this for longer than anybody. And he was still always studying. Yeah, He was still always going back. And you and I were just talking about this before we started the podcast, how, you know, no matter who the coach was, no matter what book came out, he wanted to have it. Cause if someone was doing something better, he wanted to know about it so he could change his methods. And I think especially now more than ever, it's so easy for people to think that they know it all. So they stop studying. Yeah, And that's why I think we see, I think the fitness industry is unique in many ways, not least of which it has an outrageously high burnout rate, mm -hmm. a huge burnout rate for coaches. And I think one of the main reasons is because people stop learning. And when you stop learning, it's easy to lose your passion for it. It's easy, like, why bother? You just do the same shit over and over and over again. And Louis never, ever stopped learning. Yeah. Into his 70s, for every single day that I saw him, he was, he was reading, he was referencing. It's like, what excuse do I have? 
you know, I've been doing this for a fraction of the amount of time that he has and he's still studying, like I can still study. Yeah. Do you remember when he told us how to read? Remember that day when he's like, you read this one book, you're going to become an expert. <laughs> but before you even pass judgment on this, you read two more books and we would get three books in. He goes, how relevant is that first book? And I'm like, dude, that's pretty solid wisdom right there of, um, cause you used to keep going on of coach of the month club. Like whatever comes mm. out men's fitness, they're doing whatever new book, they're an expert in that. Um, like getting those little gems of wisdom during the, it's, it wasn't really directly what he said. Yeah. It was the little knowledge bombs that would be on the peripheries of everything, right? Yes. That's what made uh, everything. He had these it. little one-liners that oh, would just man. come out of nowhere. He had one-liners that were absolute genius. And he had one-liners that were so funny that I'll, I'll like, I'll, I still tell these <laughs> yeah. jokes to this day. Like I'll never forget when he was like, what's the difference? Uh, between your wife and a dog. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he had a huge smile yeah. on his face. He's like, you, you lock your dog up in the trunk of your car. When you open it, he's still happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, dude, yeah, it was, um, did you realize how important that was going to be for us? I was sort of like, I'll just say for you that we were, how do I phrase this in a way? I think we knew from day one, this was something special mm. and we had to maximize everything from it. Yeah. And potentially that's what set us apart from everybody else. Yeah. Because people will come and go, we just talked about some visitors that come, they would try, give me, give me, give me, give me. Yeah. And Louis would like pass on, but they're like, that's it. Yeah. As if there was this miraculous secret to the universe of, hard work like no 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 this is how it works but what was it in you that knew that this was something special man there's a lot but we, we were the first interns here right I th we we're the first interns of our time of our type there was interns that came and went okay i think we were the first interns to create our own structure and yeah. understand that this is what you make of it. Yeah. You can literally just turn up and train and be like the athletes. And then you're going to get compared as an athlete. Yeah. And you're going to get kicked out the door. Yeah. We realized like they're lifting such a colossal weight. Yeah. And this is from uh, men and women. You're like, okay, that's not the pathway in here. We're both from academic backgrounds. Yeah. And like, okay, how do we pull in our own strengths? Yeah. And then we kind of, Louis is at a point of, I want to give more education to the mainstream. Yeah. How do we have someone here from the University of Delaware, someone here from Ireland, but we don't have anyone local? Like, what can I do? Yeah. And I think, too, we were lucky that we understood how important it was that we were training partners. Yeah. And not just that, we would go back. Eventually, you took me out of the, the slums here the into the middle. The ass hotel. <laughs> yeah. How much yeah. did you pay a night at that hotel? It was... $600 a week. 600 a week. Yeah. Jeez. Little stovetop, everything. <laughs> like just a terrible part of town. Louis thought it was like, this, this, this is five-star living. Um, I, I can remember like you bring me downtown. I'm like, where is this? Like, this is Columbus. I'm like, that wasn't Columbus. And you're looking at me and go, what is wrong with you? But we would go back and we would literally, it's like college. We would go study, come back, exchange notes. You were working. I remember... You like, hey, man, I think I'm going to write a book. <laughs> I'm like, you're going to write a fucking book? <laughs> On what? And you had this whole uh, Microsoft Word thing with everything <laughs> laid out. And I'm like, okay, I guess Jordan is going to write a book about stuff. Um, and then uh, I remember the, the science and practice of strength training. We were both reading at that. Yes. That's when everything started clicking. Yeah. And you and I were arriving at the same conclusions because we're in different apartments. Yep. And the trips in to the gym were like the, some of the most valuable fucking trips ever. And um, did you read that? Like, how did you interpret that? Like, I did the same thing. Yeah. And then Lou's like, oh, now you're seeing what's in the book in the gym. Yeah. And like, okay, there's this is translation process. Then we extrapolated that and put it into our own internal curriculum. Yeah. And I think that's why we were different than the rest. The rest are coming from colleges. Yeah. 
they want to get an internship here to bring it back in. But this system, the way Louis taught it, unless you integrate it yourself, it doesn't naturally fit. Yeah. It's, you can't replicate West Side's West Side. Right. You have to interpret it and put it in. Right. And we found, and I, I go back down to how important it was that the two of us were there. I think individually, for me, not having a sounding board, yeah. you could very easily get lost in an echo chamber of like, I know the system. Yeah. I got it down. And after like two or three months, I'm like, oh, pretty much have it down, I thought. And then seven years in, I started feeling more competent. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of interns, if you're there for eight to 12 weeks, you think you know it. Right. I, we never thought we... We really knew it. I thought I had a good overall knowledge. But then the more you read, like, fuck, dude. Yeah. He's got 40, 50 years plus of experience on us that we're yeah. never going to top. And the questions. I, dude, you are an animal. <laughs> like, there was. I didn't even have to think of a question because you would have two. I'm like, uh, I would ask that. Okay, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And I remember Louis loved that because he loved the Spitfire answers. Yeah. And you were really good at having no structure. Louis was the king of just his own, <laughs> like we, we entered his universe. We were yeah. in it. Um, and all that culminated to kind of like, like as cheesy as it is, I'm so proud to the success that you've had because I've met you from day one here. Yeah. Yep. And it's very easy for me to say like the Jordan you see online, that's a hundred percent, if not more in person. Yeah. And the the charismatic, the off the cuff, the everything, but actually caring. I'm like, do you were worried about me? Like, do you have bed sheets? I'm like, no, they're not coming. You're like, you have to take me into Macy's, like a little kid. Like, here's a here's a like a comforter. And like, what's a comforter? Like, uh, what's a blanket, Tom? A blanket? I'm like, yeah, I want a blanket and a sheet. And you brought me into Macy's, like a friggin' dad, and brought me around. Um, but yeah, I. I Looking back, because just reminiscing before you came about what we're going to talk about, those three months were frig a lot happened. Oh man, there is so much. And, Our and, first uh, powerlift to meet, yeah, was when Donnie Thompson squatted three thousand pounds. That was crazy. That was absolutely insane. And see, like just seeing the level of lifters, the commitment. I think something about something about the magnitude of getting the opportunity to intern with Louis and work under him about us was that I think a lot of people when they get an internship, they're usually getting an internship, not because they want to, but because they have to, whether it's for credits or, or whatever reason. Whereas for you and I, when we started with Louie, like you sold everything, you dropped everything, you moved not a couple of states, you moved internationally with nothing because you were outrageously hungry for knowledge. Mm -hmm. It wasn't outrageously hungry for fame. It wasn't outrageously hungry for recognition. It wasn't outrageously, it was outrageously hungry for knowledge. And you gave up everything in your life for that knowledge. And for me, you know, I did not give up everything in my life at all, but I was there because I was obsessed with learning and wanting to, to be the best I could possibly be for myself and for my clients and for, for other people. And I think that's why you and I, we, we didn't sit down and like, I remember sitting in the living room and just like reading books together at the same time, talking about it, whatever. And like their morning trips in and the leaving the gym, we would always, we'd be talking constantly. And it wasn't because we felt like we had to, it was because yeah. we legitimately loved it and we still do and like we're still super interested and we're always trying to learn i think that's what separates a good decent coach from a truly unbelievable high level coach and that's why when coaches tell me now that they think the industry is saturated i always laugh i'm like no it's not I'm like the industry is not saturated the in the industry is saturated with shitty coaches who saw something on Instagram and then they decided that they are a coach now. So they put that in their bio and they call themselves a coach. Mm -hmm. If that's what you consider saturated, fine. But in terms of good coaches, like great coaches who truly understand the science and can then break that science down into an easy enough format for anybody to understand, like that isn't that part of the industry is wide open. There are very few of us. And that's why I think 
if someone wants to succeed, all they need to do is first spend years studying and learning. Mm -hmm. And like, I think if you want to make content about your studies, not propping yourself up as an expert, but say I'm a student and I'm trying to learn and here's I'm making content as a student, one of the best things you can do. You're being honest and forthright and you're just, you're thirsty for hunger, but you're thirsty for knowledge to help people. That's where I think the, the magnitude of the internship came in and where I see so many coaches going wrong now is because a lot of coaches in quotes, their first thing is, how do I build a business? I'm like, you're going about this ass backwards. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about marketing if you're a really good coach with, with clients who trust you and believe in you. And you don't need to. It's like the first thing you should do is become an amazing coach. Study, 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 study. After that, if you want to dive deeper into business and understand marketing and social media and copywriting and email and all that, great, that's fine. But if you're doing all of that without the foundation of intense high-level knowledge, you're shortchanging yourself, you're shortchanging your clients, and you're probably going to burn out. The one thing people can't take away from you is experience. And people want to be credible instantaneous. And it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. I'd imagine, even though the person and the person is still the same, but Jordan, the coach, is not the same Jordan I was here in 2011. Yeah. Because you took your knowledge, interpreted, like you wrote a really good article in the Conjugal Method that was digestible for everyone. Yeah. And you're like, but even that will evolve when you talk with more and more people. Because when you live in the West Side bubble, right? We couldn't even conceive of a world that couldn't pull sleds. Then you come out of it like, well, what the hell is a sled? And you're like, <laughs> okay, now the more experienced, the more you talk with people, you realize, okay, we have to do a better job of foundational knowledge. Yes. And that comes with time. And the more coaches you talk to, the best ones in the world, it's the simplest conversation. There's no Latin terminology. Yes. There's no other things. Like, it's super simple. And it's mostly a conversation. Yeah. It's not like, hey, selling your secrets. Right. They're literally just talking. And part of the conversation is the training. Correct. And it's more about life and philosophy. How do you look at things? How do you interact? Yeah. Half the battle, especially with pro athletes, as you know, is, is the communication. The training is pretty simple. Yeah. It's how do you manage the relationship? And I don't think there's any book out there that can beat working with constant athletes. A hundred percent. The one thing that... I don't think Louis gets enough credit for. I'll never forget when he was talking about how to train and speak with different types of clients based on if they're introverted, they're extroverted. Yeah. And I was like, this, listen, I took strength and conditioning in school. I've read more books than probably most people on this stuff. And I haven't heard any other coach talk about that. Definitely no professors or any of that. And that's, you know, my family gets so mad at me because my whole family is, professors and teachers and all of that. And, and I always say to piss them off, but also I partly think it's true. It's like those who can't do teach. It's like a lot of my professors in school who are teaching exercise physiology, exercise science, strength and conditioning, they'd never coached anybody. Mm -hmm. They were just reading from one book that they had learned from when they were in school and they were spewing the same things off over and over and over again. Um, when you really coach people in person for years, it's impossible not to learn that there are different ways to communicate with different athletes and different uh, lifters. And, and when I say an athlete or a lifter, I don't necessarily mean someone who, who has a 1500 plus total. I mean, anybody who yeah. wants to lift, anybody, a mom, a dad, a kid, whatever, depending on the person as the individual, there are different ways to communicate with them that will allow their training to be more or less effective if you understand it or if you don't understand it. I think that was one of the, the best things I ever learned from Louis about the coaching process, which by the way, transfers over into content creation. It transfers over into writing articles, writing Instagram captions, making YouTube videos, having podcasts, like every word that comes out of my mouth or my fingers or whatever, it's all deliberate. It, none of it is, is by mistake. And yeah. if, it, if it sounds like it's just off the cuff, I think it's just because it's, some, it's so much practice. It's just so much practice and understanding and making mistakes and making mistakes and making mistakes and realizing, oh, phrasing it, it could be the exact same method, but phrasing it this way versus phrasing it this way will have all the difference in the world in yeah. terms of 
Do they stick with it? Do they understand it? Do they trust it? Do they believe in it? It's uh, and I think Louis was a genius at that. And I don't know anybody who who'd said that stuff before him, and very few, if anybody, has said it after him. Like, I think he really was the first of his kind in many ways, but not least of which understanding client psychology yeah. and individualization outside of just understanding muscular development, strength development, tendons, ligaments, all it's like, but the brain, the yeah. mind, who are you working with and how can you connect with that individual? Did you ever think back when he was writing in Powerlifting USA and compared to today, like he was putting out his home phone number <laughs> at the end of every article for people and genuinely answered the phone. Yeah. And the VHS tapes, before that was a thing, he was releasing VHS tapes of the secrets. Um, so he was doing content creation before it really was the animal it is today. Yes. But he, he was, was doing meaningful, con like it wasn't propped up on false promises. Correct. If you look at some of the VHS tapes, the phone is ringing in the background. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you know the one, but he's getting pissed and then Doris goes to pick it up and answers the phone while he's on camera. And he's like, what is going on? She's like, oh, let us call you back. And comes back in. But that, like, it's remarkable how much he didn't realize what he was doing because he was just being Lou. Yeah. That indirectly or directly, people have based their whole businesses around. Like, look at the lineage of Westside Barbell. Yeah. It's freaking crazy. Dude, it's it's. I got chills thinking about it. It's like insane. How many people hate it or love it? And I can understand from an athlete's perspective, you're going to have a very skewed account depending on which side of Louis you were on for how long. Yeah. But still, <laughs> it uh, it aided in development. Oh, my God. Um, it catapulted it. It, it did. And no he, matter what. It, when you had, I had a hard time understanding Louis' perception. Oh, the business burns down. Yeah. Still have the gym. I'm like, what do you mean? You still have the gym this is like no no like the gym it was education before profit athletes betterment before profit people's like we had two super bowl coaches a high school coach and someone just came in and everyone got treated the exact same yeah and like where else like i was talking about we had prison guards prisoners we had every shape of walk of life come in here and all be connected with the gym everyone got treated the same yeah and like that wasn't taught. That was just who Louis was. Yeah. And we got to see Louis's last competition. We got to see competition Lou, go into full-time coaching Lou, go into how he's dealing with all these people. And one thing that I will never, there's a lot of things I'll never forget about him. He'd always introduce himself. When you know, everyone knows who this guy is. He would go up, shake your hand and say, hello, I'm Louis Simmons. Nice yeah. to meet you. No matter what... And if he knew you hated him, he would go up, oh, shake your hand, and go, hi. I'm... I, I remember there was this happened. <laughs> we were out at a Texas Roadhouse or one of, some steak place. And uh, he saw someone that he knew was just, at the time, this was online was starting to bicker. Yeah. And uh, he went up, shook his hand, like, hey, Lou, it was nice to meet you. <laughs> Completely floored. It's like, uh, okay. I'm like, Lou, why'd you do that? He's like, I'd rather get it done now than wait. <laughs> if something's going to happen, I'd rather get it before I get my food. Um, <laughs> just always thinking. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's it really, that 2011 year is just really remarkable just yeah. to think back on. Yeah. Um, I, I remember, I, was, I can't remember if I told Donnie Thompson this, but do you remember when he sat down in front of us? He was so big. Oh my God, dude. He took up two chairs. Yes. And I, like a kid with a like red button, couldn't stop my finger going <laughs> and pressed like into his lat. Yeah. And it was like, it was just a rock and he couldn't turn. So he was like, and I was like, oh, excuse me. I was like, holy shit, that's the biggest human. Yeah. Shaq passed out twice. Yep. Yep. Um, remember the bench press? The guy who dropped the 500 pounds Bumble. on his chest yeah. for his neck. Yeah, they had, yeah. To cut, they had to cut the bench shirt, shirt off. off him. Him. Heard the crunch. Oh, my God. And when all this was happening, Louis, I can't remember, I think it was Billy Minima, were talking <laughs> and they just looked and like, oh, like as if nothing's happened. Yeah. Everyone else is going around doing their thing, trying to get this guy out. They're just having their conversation. Like, how much stuff have you guys seen <laughs> that this is just yeah. normal? I mean, even Lou, like stories of him, like, getting out of surgery and then going to lift. I know. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> just insane. And watching the athletes come in and out, mm. no one is forcing them in. They're like, there's this gravitational pull that's pulling them in. Um, they have a they have a duty to give back to the gym. But what's amazing is like whether they disliked the place or loved the place, they all still kept coming in and you could see the value of the culture, right? Culture is what created a consistency for everything. Yep. Without that consistency, your training methods don't matter because if you're going to be haphazard, what does it matter what you're doing? And I think he gave an indirect example for that of which I don't think he gets enough credit for we touched on the psychological aspect, the culture aspect. Um, I know he would like deliberately piss lifters off. Oh yeah. Knowing that like he he didn't want to piss them off for the sake of pissing them off. He was doing it deliberately to get them to work harder, get them to prove him wrong. Yeah. Like almost make himself the enemy so that if the lifter like maybe didn't have enough motivation or enough drive or anger, he's like, I'll make you angry. Yeah. And you can be angry at me and take it out on the bar. And like he was so good, I feel like, at knowing what each lifter needed at a certain point in time. He didn't just have one method. Like I think if if one person didn't respond well to that type of just getting angry, then he would take a different approach. Yeah. It's just a master class in, in lifter psychology and or human psychology. And it's very hard to articulate that in an article or a blog. You have to yeah. experience it. You got the loo you needed. Yeah. Whether it was bad or good. Um, a lot of people stayed beyond the time they needed to be. Yeah. And we were, we're still in the middle of doing it, a whole legacy series of uh, hearing the people who were kind of like the core Westsiders, not necessarily the most famous people through here. But there was a shift when they started in the 70s uh, in the basement of his house, then went to the, the garage or the garage, whatever it is here. Garage. I, I keep saying garage. Like, is garage in Ireland? Yeah, this? yeah. I was going up with uh, with, with uh, Dominic Rotolo and they're like, bro, I remember. What are you saying? Dude, I remember you looked at me going, what the fuck? I had a hard time. Louis couldn't understand you for the yeah. first, like what, at least two weeks. Uh, dude, at least one year. <laughs> maybe, maybe 12 years. Maybe like, that's why I lasted so long. He was like, okay. He would just walk out the door. Your accent was so strong and you spoke so fast when you yeah. first came. Like, oh my God, I, remember, I vividly remember Louis having no clue what you said at all. And he would hear you say something and he'd just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, did I do something wrong? Jordan, like you'd you ask him a question and I'd look to see what he'd answer with. And he'd just <laughs> walk away. <laughs> <sighs> oh, dude. It was, um, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, the... The times that Louis relished was the 70s, 80s, 90s. I hope to that, but you can see the progress of everyone's interpretation of Westside. Mm -hmm. When they first started, it was um, strength of mind, strength of body, not necessarily the most important thing, but you had a purpose and you trained hard. Mm -hmm. Then it was culture. Now you're in, you're in the Westside system. You wear the shirt, you're part of this. Like there's Westside and then there's the rest of the world. Mm -hmm then the gym started getting really strong. So now there was a transition period of, well, we can't just bring someone up. It'd take too long. So you had tr people who transplant in who were very strong, but developed that foundation somewhere else. Yeah. And there seems to, that's when a lot of people butted heads. It's like, well, you're not West Side. Yeah, you're strong. but we'll fucking smoke you in work ethic. And that, that's where you had this. And Louis fucking loved like that kind of rift. Yeah. And what's very interesting is a lot of those, the newer generation of people had a lifespan of three to five years. Mm. When you still see the guys from the 70s and 80s, they still hang out to this day. Yeah. I don't know how many of the people that we were around still hang out that much or still talk. Right. Like I know uh, Tony Ramos and George Halbert still talk, interact, but all these guys still get together from the 70s and 80s. And you're like, oh, that's the culture which the gym is based on. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of helping me understand the importance of the legacy journey we're on to really to make sure it goes nowhere because that you can't replicate that. Yeah. Like no one's going to have 40 years. Like, well, give me 40 years to see if we're right. Like, no, it's been done. And seeing the importance of the two cultures of like, okay, that's why these guys didn't last too long. They didn't have the foundational understanding. Yeah. And to pull it back into our conversations, back to that internship, 
we took our time after that to understand to to uh, excuse me to learn the ropes and i mean dude you pay, paved your own way which uh hugely give you a shit ton of credit for because you have many landscapes to traverse right and you kept it so ethical with west side and always paid respects and did and not like we didn't reach out once we didn't hey jordan can you make sure to do this, this? you just did it naturally right yeah and um you periodically touch base do things which not many people have done, which mm-hmm. is like strange in one sense. But um, do you think that was foundationally who you are or was it all from that internship? I think for me, listen, I, I've never been an academic. Uh, you know, my whole family is academics and I've always been, I was in special education growing up. Like I was never a, a traditionally smart person. Um, when I found something that I was really passionate about, well, now it was worth it to spend the time studying and all of that. But more than anything, I think I've always been more of a relationship person Mm -hmm. as opposed to a thing person. And, um, going back to the culture of the people who still hang out to this day versus the people who were only here for a few years and then they sort of just branch off. For me, the relationships that were built through that, whether it was with you or with Louis, or even if it's just paying respect to the time and energy and money that went into teaching me, it's like, I, you know, when, when you feel something in your gut, when you're like, you know, what's right mm-hmm. and you know, what's wrong. I think a lot of people, myself included at different for different things in life, like, well, it's, it can be easy to ignore that feeling and do the wrong thing. When it came to, writing articles and giving credit where it's due to Louis and to West Side, I could never ignore that feeling. Like I would feel like shit if I ever didn't give him credit. Yep. It would just, there's something about it that would be like nauseating and it would be like, it would, it would be the worst. So for me, it just, it's, you guys never reached out once. You never said, hey, could you do this? Hey, could you do that? It was just like, I'm gonna write about what I learned and when I do that, I'm going to give credit to the people who taught it to me. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And so it's, it was never a question, but also understanding, you know, as I get older, I start to realize how short life is, like how unbelievably short it is and how many people have burned bridges and how many friendships have been lost for stupid things that yeah. like, and I was like, I don't ever want to lose what I have, whether it's with Louie or with Tom or whatever. Like I never want to lose that. So it's, uh, it's you no, know, whether I like it or it's always gonna be a part of who I am. Always. West side will always be a part of who I am. And there's no way I could have ever gotten to where I am if it wasn't for Louie and it wasn't for West side and it wasn't for our conversations and, and us hanging out and having that opportunity together. There's no way. So it, it's just, I think for me, it was just, this is part of my story and I'm not being honest if I'm not sharing that this is where I gained this knowledge. Yeah. Where do you see us going? West from, side? Yeah, just say from someone who's been in it, observing it, to like we're coming up on the 24th, which is a year yeah. after Lou's past. Where would you think um, the natural place? Like what? what's your... Well, I think first and foremost, I think West Side is in amazing hands with you running everything. And I, I don't I think that, that people realize how fucking smart you are. And not only that, but also how much you care, like how much you care about West Side, how much you care about the lifters, how much you care about these employees, how much you care about Louis's legacy and everything. Like the bar none, the most loyal, I was telling you this earlier, I'm not sure if Louis fully realized how blessed he was to have hit the jackpot with you to sell everything, move across the world, come here, and then just be the most loyal. And Because so many people would have taken that opportunity and then run away with it, taken everything, everything they could get, and once it dried up, boom, they leave. And the reason that you're still here is because you're so loyal, you're unbelievably intelligent, and Louis saw that in you, and what a blessing that that it was at the right place and the right time and that he was able to get you to come. Um, 
So if I had to guess, and this is a very uneducated guess, it's just based off of what I've seen over the last, I don't know, few hours <laughs> going around and, and being back for the first time in like 12 years, I think um, from what it looks like, there's a huge, I, I think West Side is going to be the gym for, without question, for mixed martial arts. I think there are a, a lot of sports will have are always here. They always will be here in a lot of, you know, whether it's football, whatever. There will always be athletes and coaches wanting to learn from West Side. I think that the conjugate method, and this could also be part of my bias because I love mixed martial arts and I love jujitsu and I, I love wrestling. And so I love all of that. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to incorporate conjugate into my training to improve myself for that tremendously. But you know, you're working with some of the best grapplers and the best fighters to ever walk the earth. And I think that the more that that gets out and the more people start to see that, I think West Side is going to be the place that fighters will come to, whether they're young young fighters who are looking to make that their life or they're fighters in the prime of their career or fighters who are near the end of their career. I think they're going to start coming to West Side. They already have. I think it's going to build and build and build. Um, it's already such a, a well-known brand and name and uh a training methodology. But if I had to guess, I think we will see a huge, huge push toward, because I mean, all, not to mention mixed martial arts has grown mm -hmm. unbelievably in the last 10 years and even more so in the last five years, like the last five years have been insane. Looking at the growth of UFC and Bellator and 1FC and just like, and even just pure jujitsu. Yeah. Like looking at the the explosion of grappling towards the mainstream is pretty insane. And you can even see it just in terms of how many more jujitsu academies are popping up all over the country and the world. Like people are just excited to go do jujitsu. And as people get into jujitsu and mixed martial arts, they're gonna be looking for training methods to make sure they don't get injured, make sure that they can get stronger, be better, more strong and more conditioned than their opponents. And I think West Side is gonna be the leading leading a methodology and leading, I don't even want to call it a company, but a, the leading, the, the leader in that world for helping fighters reach their peak performance. Well, I appreciate all the kind words. It was a, a different question to give to you, but I think it's important for transparency, right? Yeah. To go, hey, what's your interpretation of us, where we're going? And that, I think if I can do that more going forward with podcasts, with content, yeah. it still remains the people's champ, right? That West Side is like, be as transparent as possible. Everything we're doing is um, still to this day, uh, the athletes that come in here, there's no monetary charge. Yeah. And then people go, well, why not? I'm like, well, Louis taught us one is that we have seen people come to Lou and go, hey, what potential do you think I have? And you're like, oh, oh. And he goes, do you really want to know? Like, yes, none. <laughs> you're like, oh, man, that's such. But like, was he wrong? No. Did yeah. he sugarcoat it? No, that's just Lou. Yeah. But we're able to get content from these. And everyone knows you come in here, we need consistency. And we want to get some educational content that we give out. Mm -hmm. And I think having coaches, having people who understand it from both sides, it's a good way to show everyone and for everyone to listen to like okay that's just not me speaking this is what you're seeing potentially and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll have a common thread throughout yeah um because it's a very strange time in that nothing is different but all has changed like you walk into the gym it's like a little time capsule yeah there's a few little different things but you're like Underneath that red monolith is still that bloodstained carpet. Yeah. Like deadlift platform is still the same. You're like, oh, okay, that's, there's still that, uh, that sensation when you walk in, you're like, okay, you feel it. You feel it down to your core. Like this is mm -hmm. West Side. Just seeing athletes in their training, seeing them shit talking, like, okay, yeah, that's, that's about right. And it's to make sure we don't never lose focus of that. Um, another question that arises from this is like, how have you avoided the trap? of selling out that's a very broad term but you've always been you yeah which a lot of people started off in themselves and have drifted way yeah. far center yeah i mean 
I think number one is having a mentor like Louis to see like from day one, Louis was Louis and he didn't pretend to be anybody else, which like, you, you know, it's a very cliche phrase to the point where it's almost annoying, but you know, the people you surround yourself with, like the, you know, the five people, you're the average of the five people you surround yourself with. It's sort of annoying and cliche, but it is also very true in that I was so fortunate to have Louis be one of my first mentors not just in lifting and in strength and conditioning and in program design and in coaching, but from a business perspective. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he gave me a key to his gym, never mind the fact that he let me come out here and train for free 11 times a week and took me out to meals and gave me everything for free. It's like people ask me all the time because I give stuff away for free constantly. It's like, it's what I do. I give everything away for free. And uh, people are like, why do you do this? And I get all these marketers and people in my inbox, be like, you can make more money, you can make more money. I'm like, you don't get it. Like, you, you don't understand. And I try not to get angry, but I, I, I get pissed off. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like, I don't want to do this. But like, they, they don't understand where I come from or who I learned from. They don't understand that mentality. And I, to be very honest, there were times when I was you know, surrounding myself with the wrong people where I felt myself starting to drift. And ironically, when I started to drift and maybe be someone who I be like, try to put on a facade or be someone I wasn't, I got a lot of anxiety. My business did worse. I had fewer people coming in as clients. I had more clients leaving and I didn't like myself. And thank God, I never kept pushing that boundary and went full off the reservation. Yeah. Because whenever I went back to the way that Louis did it, where like Louis was Louis, like I just, I try and be me. And I try and give as much as I can for free and help people as much as I can for free. You're talking about, you know, Louis would put his phone number in the magazines. Like I regularly hop on the phone with people nowadays and people can't fucking believe it. Like people will DM me, they'll ask me a question. I send them my number and we'll get on the phone and they're like, I can't believe I'm actually talking to you. And I'm, it's great because that's exactly how I felt yeah. when Louis got on the phone with me. And, uh, or recently there was a guy who was like, Hey, cause I'm, I'm based out of Dallas. He was like, Hey, I'm in Dallas. I'd love to meet you for coffee. And I was like, let's go, let's do it. Let's get a lift in. Let's go get coffee. Like couldn't believe it. And, uh, I, without question attribute that to being here and watching Louis have an unbelievably equipped gym, not charging at anybody to come train there. Everybody can go train, getting on the phone with anybody, sitting down with every, giving everybody the time of day, whether they're a high powered CEO or, or a janitor or a truck driver, whatever it is, like treats everyone the same. And he's always whoever he is. So I think truly having you know, the whole phrase, like seeing is believing, mm -hmm. seeing Louis do that showed me, oh, this is not just a possibility, but this is, this is a reality. And as long as I stay true to who I am, like you can't really go wrong. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Mm. Is that the bones of all these years of like the trials and tribulations that, that, um, that you've arrived at that. Yeah. It's, um, because it, it's, Yeah, it's, it's hard not to, um, like, understand that deeply. For something so simple, it's the truth, right? And, yeah. Um, people want to have some fancy wrapped up answer, like, here, here it is, here's a package, buy this. Yeah. Um, it's so easy to be swayed because, listen, I get people in my DMs and inbox like, oh, you could do this. If you just do this marketing method, you could 10x your income, da 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 And I think it's very easy for people to get wooed and, and like, oh my God, I got to do that, da, 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 da. In the same way, there are people who are like, I just need to know the best system to work out. And they want the best system, but they don't want to lift the weights. Yeah. They don't want to actually do the work. It's like, none of this matters. No, the system doesn't matter, whether it's for strength training or for business or for your, your family life with your wife and your kid. None of it matters if you aren't willing to put in the work. Yeah. And in any scenario, business, strength and conditioning, family, whatever, if you aren't being yourself truly, something's going to break. Whether it's you or the relationship or so, like you, I think Louis was the best at that. 
and thank God that I was blessed enough to, to see it firsthand because it, it, it shaped my entire outlook on everything that I do. What are you most proud of? Oh man, that's a question. What am I most proud of? Um, I, there's a lot that I'll say, but I think one of, one of the things I am most proud of is I have worked with a fair number of coaches as I've grown in the industry and, and younger coaches have reached out. Um, and I am very proud of the number of coaches who I've directly worked with and spoken with who are crushing it. And not just business-wise, but their clients are crushing it and they're helping thousands of people as well. And selfishly, I can look at that and say, look how many people this person's helping. Look how many people this person's helping. And like, I can trace back the relationship to a call that I had in the middle of COVID with this random coach who asked to get on the phone with me when they had zero followers and they had zero coaching experience. And I got on the phone, I told them what books to read because of Louis. I told them what to study. I told them how to interact with people. Like I, and I can trace like all of these people they're helping it will come back to me, which then also goes back to Louie and, and my mentors. But I'm very proud of, of seeing how many people I've been indirectly able to impact because of what I've learned from Louie and because I've taken that time and that energy to try and help those people. And so yeah. if we, Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot where helping just one person has a massive ripple effect across the entire world even something as simple as someone's having a really bad day and you don't know them. Maybe you're in the grocery store, you pass by someone and like, just give them a smile or you compliment the shoes they're wearing, whatever it is. Saying something just nice, genuine, you have a small positive impact on that person that could change their day entirely, which leads them to have a positive impact on someone else and so on and so on. You get a huge ripple. And so I think about this a lot and I, I, I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peterson for many reasons, not least of which understanding I think it's very easy to overlook the impact you can make on the world just by helping one person, especially in a day and age in which social media followers, the more followers you have, the, the more people look up to you and they think the better you are. And if someone quote unquote only has 500 followers, they might think they're not making a difference. It's like, you can make a difference in millions of people's lives through a ripple effect. You might not directly see it, but everything you do, every interaction you have, has an ability to make the world infinitely better mm -hmm. and likewise infinitely worse, depending on, on how you go after it. So I think for me, one of the things I'm most proud of is seeing a lot of the positive impact I've been able to indirectly have through speaking mm -hmm. with people. Where do you see your next 12 years mapping out? People have asked me this since, since I first met you. People have asked like, what's your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, all that stuff. And I give the same answer every time. I have no fucking clue. I have no, I don't have a plan. I have, I have no idea. I have a, a six and a half month old daughter with my wife and like they're everything to me. So obviously, you know, God willing, building a bigger family with more kids and, and spending time with them. But in terms of business, I always, this is what I say. Number one, I have no idea. I don't have a business plan. I never have and I never will. The only objective I've ever had is to like just help as many people as I possibly can. That's it. And as long as that's been the goal, things have gone very well. Yeah. Every day, like waking up, all right, how am I going to help someone today? How am I like, that's literally like, okay, what post can I make that's going to help? What, what conversation can I have that's going to help? Like, that's my goal. It's not trying to reach a certain amount of income or, and there's nothing wrong with making money. If the more money you make, the more opportunities you have to be selfless and to really help people through charity and through many different things. But I think if the goal starts with making money, you actually lose a lot of the ability to help people and often more anxiety comes with it. So for me, it's just help as many people as I can in whatever capacity possible. And that's it. And I very much think about it like when I realized I was losing passion for powerlifting, I stopped. When I realized this is no longer like for me, I don't want to lift like powerlift anymore. I want to mm -hmm. do something else. I stopped because it wasn't for me anymore. So if a day comes when... I'm tired of it and I don't wanna do it anymore and I lose the passion, then I'll stop. And I, I think there's a lot of power in that because I always say like, 
you know how, how Louis said, you know, if the business fails, still have the gym. I very much, and I think it's most likely influenced by him, is that worst comes to worst. Let's say, let's say I get canceled or my Instagram and YouTube and pot, all of my stuff gets taken down and I lose everything. I could always just coach people in person. I can always do that. Yeah. I'm very good at it and I enjoy it. So worst case scenario, I get to do what I love. So it's really the f Yoda. There's a, I'm not even a big Star Wars guy, but there's a great Yoda quote that goes to the effect of get used to, or try to, uh, something to the effect of detach yourself from everything you have and get used to the idea of, of losing everything that you hold dear. And once you get okay with that, there are really no real big problems. Uh, more, uh, my Moto Masashi. Yes. Very much like one of his uh, precepts. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, I think it's so easy to get caught up in, I need to have this, I need to have more, you know, the MTV cribs and like looking <laughs> at what car people drive and how many followers they have. It's like, these are all things that do not bring happiness. And I've seen it at the highest level. I've seen some of the wealthiest people in the world. And I've, I've seen how unhappy they are. And I'm like, and I look at the longest living people in the world. They're not the richest. No. They're also not the poorest. They're, uh, they're definitely not entrepreneurs, right? They're not the people grinding all day, every single day. Uh, it's generally the people who live the longest or the healthiest are the people who have the best balance. They're pretty moderate. They like, they have what they need, but not much more than that. Like, cool. Like you can live yeah. a really good life that way. They got good family and they're always a part of nature, right? Yes. Nature, family, everything. Exactly. Is there anything that excites you outside of your business in terms of like, hmm, that's a very interesting field. Like that could be a possibility later on. So... I am obsessed with jujitsu right now. Aside from my wife and my daughter, jujitsu is, I constantly think about it. I'm obsessed with it. It's like the most fun thing to me right now. And um, part of me is very scared to go into that world and potentially try and build a business in that world because I don't want it to become a job. Yeah. I do it right now and I am the student and I love learning and I don't want people like I don't want I don't want to lose my passion for it because I make it a business which I think happens a lot. Yeah. But the other side of me is like I could really help a lot of jiu-jitsu athletes and and for me I think my so most of my clients are women. I'm about 80% female clients anywhere from 18 to 80 but usually in that like 35 to 70 range. And the more I've been doing jujitsu over the last almost four years now, I've been heavily advocating for women to get into jujitsu in the same way I advocated for women to get into powerlifting. But I mean, I see videos all the time of women getting attacked and like horror stories of, of what women go through mm -hmm. in, in, many, in many different circumstances. And bro, I roll with some, some women in jujitsu and some young girls who fucking kill me, who have never lifted a weight in their life. There's this one girl at the gym I train at now. Her name is Vanessa. She's 16 years old. God help any dude that tries to fuck with this girl. She, so again, like I'm a pretty strong guy, like I'm, especially for my size. I'm, I have a 10 year wrestling background. I've been training jujitsu four to six days a week for almost four years now. And this girl destroys me there. I couldn't, if I, if her and I got in a legitimate fight, she would literally kill me. And I don't, it's not fair. Literally, she would kill me. And she's like a hundred pounds. Um, and I see the confidence that it gives her. Yeah. And I see how that bleeds over into her life. And so I think there's a huge part of me that would love to get into jujitsu, not teaching jujitsu, but teaching but encouraging people to try jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And once people get in there, giving them a great program, strength training, mobility, conditioning, and nutrition 
to be able to do it as a part of their life, not to be the best jujitsu competitor in the world, but to incorporate jujitsu into their life to make them harder to kill, yeah. to make them more confident. And uh, so that's sort of like what I'm juggling with right now. Do I want to or do I not want to? And if if I did start another business, it would probably be there, but not right now. Right now, it's you just enjoy it. Did you ever think it would be as popular as it's become in terms of um, that we actually are witnessing the first generation of paid professional grapplers? You know, I, here's the thing. I grew, I started wrestling when I was eight years old and I fell in love with it at eight years old. And I never understood why wrestling and jujitsu and all this stuff, like it wasn't yeah. bigger. And I remember watching Hoist Gracie and, and all these early guys in the UFC and in Pride who were high level grapplers submitting people who were 50, 75, 100 pounds heavier than them. And I was, I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. Even watching something like, I remember watching people hit arm bars or triangles and being like, how the fuck do you do that? Yeah. Just blown. And I, so I can, I'm not surprised that it's gotten so big. I, I am just very happy that yeah. it's growing and it's, it's growing in popularity because I don't know if this is true. One of my buddies told me this. I haven't fact checked this. I think it's true that in Dubai, it is mandated for all school children oh, yeah. to yes. train jujitsu. And, you know, I lived in Israel for several years and everyone in Israel, men and women have to serve in the army, men for three years, women for two years, minimums, and everyone learns how to fight. And in, this is all like, freely available data, you can see that in cultures in which people know how to fight, crime is at an all-time low. Yeah. Because no one wants to fuck with someone else when everyone knows how to fight. And that's what I see in in MMA gyms and jiu-jitsu academies. You have these killers, these straight up killers who are the nicest people in the world, who are like so sweet and so over the top kind. They don't want to fight for many reasons, not least of which you never know if they're better than you. And if oh, you're yeah. training in a, in a mixed martial arts facility or a jiu-jitsu academy, you know there's always someone better than you. There's always someone who can <laughs> kill you and you never know if that's the person you're meeting on the street. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I'm just very, very happy that jiu-jitsu is growing as a sport and as, as, a, as a sport for the athletes who can make legitimate careers mm -hmm. out of it and support their families without necessarily you know, doing full on mixed martial arts and having to get elbowed in the face and risk their entire life through, through awful injuries and all of that. Like jujitsu, you can get really injured, but the injury rate is way lower than in something like mixed martial arts, especially the head injuries and all of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just really happy to see it exploding. And I think only good can come from it. I could talk to you for hours, <laughs> as you know. Um, I want to be cognizant of your time the to bring it back full circle is there one thing you wish i would have asked you during this conversation bro honestly i'm just so blessed to be here hanging out with you and like it's it's part of me feels like being here training with you and at west side was a different life and part of me feels like it was two weeks ago yeah and uh I remember growing up and hearing my parents say like, oh yeah, like I know this person from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever it is. And I'd be like, I'm not even that age yet. Like crazy. And now I'm getting to a point where it's like, it was 12 years ago that you and I trained together at Westside. And before we know it, it's going to be 20 and 30 and yeah. so on. And so, man, I'm just blessed to be here. And I'm so happy to see you doing so well and to see you carrying on Westside and growing it and making, I mean, this, look at the setup, the setup's insane. And this is just one tiny part of Westside as a whole directly because of the influence you've had on it. So uh, to answer your question, no, it's just, I am so, so, so happy to see you doing so well. And uh, I, I love you to death and I appreciate you. And, and I hope listeners and people watching, I hope they know with all of their heart and all those, because a lot of people have so much love for Louis. They have so much love for Louis, even though they never met him. And I think it's important for them to know that there could not be a better person than you 
to to move forward with Westside and continue to carry on the name and improve the world of strength and conditioning and and just make people's lives better. So it's just it's amazing to be here with you, and I'm super super happy for you. I appreciate the the kind words, and they're definitely reciprocated back uh, to see your su- uh, success and the growth, and to see where you're at from the guy who's like, hey, I think I'm going to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how many books you've put out for free. That you put out a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, it's truly an honor to know you, and even more so to be your friend. And uh, I appreciate you coming in. And um, hopefully, we won't have to wait 12 more years the next time. <laughs> Jordan, thank you. Thank you, man.